I abhor most of all is the female breast. Imagine being Arthur Venning and having to get into bed with Susan Warrington and her enormous bosom. What's brought this on, Hurst? They don't normally take on like this until after dinner. Just watching them. In the hotel. Women. They're grotesque. It was four in the afternoon, and we were walking up the hill which led to the Ambrose's villa. I was glad of Hurst's ridiculous outburst, as I myself was in the most peculiar state of mind. It had begun two days ago, after the ball, and was what I can only describe as an acute sense of having been interrupted in the middle of a profoundly interesting conversation. I could think of nothing else but that I had to get back to it, to continue it. And this conversation was with Rachel Vinrace. I wasn't in love with her, I was certain of that. But the need to talk to her again, to find out more, was so intense that I'd wandered past her villa several times the previous day in the vain and foolish hope of bumping into her. And now here I was, armed with a legitimate invitation to tea, knowing that within ten minutes I would certainly be with her. I wasn't aware that you found Helen Ambrose grotesque. Ah, but she's different. I can talk to her like a man. About anything. Sex, Cambridge, the bar. No, no more like her. Perhaps lots of young women will turn out to be just like her. It's only that we've never spent time with a clever woman of her age before. Rachel might turn out like her. Oh, I doubt that. Why? Because she's just like all the rest. Vapid, with no opinions of her own. Oh, I completely disagree. I told you her opinion of you to start with. Hmm. I sent her a book, you know. Who? Miss Finrace. Rachel. I took her gibbon the morning after the ball before I'd even gone to bed. Why? I was conscious of a tightening feeling in my stomach. Because I felt bad when you told me I'd hurt her feelings. I'm not a complete toad, you know. And besides, uh, Helen wanted me to. Helen wanted you to take her gibbon? Hmm. She said uh, Rachel needs experience. Contact with the opposite sex. Did she? And I think she needs educating first. I couldn't possibly take up with a girl who hadn't read Gibbon. And do you intend taking up with her? Of course not. Not at the moment. But one never knows. I struggled to maintain my composure. What was it I was feeling? Not jealousy. There wasn't enough method in Hurst's madness to inspire that. There was a sort of annoyance that he assumed he could pick her up at will, that he could change her thoughts and feelings. And if he assumed that, how many other men would assume it too? What if she had met one last night? What if he was there now? We had reached the iron gate of the villa. I thrust it open and strode, almost ran up the gravel drive. What's the hurry, Hewitt? For goodness sake! They were sitting under a tree in the garden, Helen, Rachel and Mr. Ambrose. And they did have company, but only in the form of an imperious-looking lady who I'd seen arriving at the hotel that morning. I smiled at Rachel and she smiled back. Gentlemen, I'm so glad you could join us. Mr. Hewitt, Mr. Hurst, may I introduce Mrs. Flushing? How do you do? How do you do? Charmed. Charmed. Oh, sit down, please. Help yourselves to scones and jam. We sat down on either side of Rachel. I noticed the gibbon lying open on the floor beside her chair. May I go and get a cushion, Helen? Of course. In fact, take mine. I don't need it. Oh, thank you. Rheumatism. Rheumatism? At your age? Was it brought on by the dancing? Rheumatism's a state of mind. We could all be rheumatic if we chose to be. I assure you, madam, that mine is all too real. Listen, when I move my wrists, the bones grate together. Like, like chalk. I'm sure yours don't. I should think not. You wouldn't have lasted long in my family. Cold baths in the stable yard, covered in ice in winter. We had to get in or we were whipped. The strong ones lived, the others died. A most excellent plan if you've 13 children. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs Flushing was a woman of 40, perhaps, very well set up and wearing a concoction of clothes which could have been donned with the specific purpose of proving Hurst's earlier point. She was topped off by a tall hat with a canary-coloured plume which jerked alarmingly whenever she spoke. I watched her now as she took out a cigarette, crossed her legs and lit it. Mr Ambrose looked faintly appalled. Ridley, do you remember Mrs Flushing's husband, Mr Wilfred Flushing? Have I met him? Yes, at one of Mrs Raymond Parry's parties. He's a collector. 
He has that extraordinary shop in Bloomsbury. Ah, yes. That rings a bell. We want your help, Mr. Ambrose. My help? We're after more stuff. We've picked up a fair amount already on this trip, but we're here looking for more. I, I understand you know the country round here better than anyone. Well, I'm not sure that's the case. Not old things, new things, you understand? Nothing more than 20 years old interests me. Mouldy old pictures, <clears throat> dirty old books. They stick them in museums when they're only fit for burning. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say any more if I were you. I'm afraid Ridley reveres anything old. He spends his life in digging up manuscripts which nobody wants. What a treacherous <laughs> creature you are. There's a clever man in London called John who paints ever so much better than the old masters. Augustus John. His pictures excite me. Nothing that's old excites me. <laughs> Gibbon, how are you getting on with it? Then I'll have I'm not. Word. It goes I'll round, 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 round like a roll of oil cloth. What do you mean? Surely it's the most perfect style that's ever been invented. Every sentence is practically perfect. And the wit... I'm afraid I don't like it. I'm sorry, Mr. Hurst. It was very kind of you. Then I give you up in despair. I despair too, then. How are you going to judge people merely by their minds? What else? You agree with my spinster aunt, I expect. Be good, sweet maid. I thought the likes of Charles Kinsley and my aunt were obsolete. I, I'm sure one can be very nice without having read a book. Uh, excuse me, but I've spent most of my life with people like your aunt, Mr. Hurst. They've never heard of Gibbon. They care only for their pheasants and their peasants. <laughs> Say what you like against them, but they're some of the finest and kindest human beings on the face of the earth. Excuse me, but my aunt spends her life in East Lambeth among the degraded poor. I only quoted my aunt because she is inclined to persecute people she calls intellectual. Which is what I suspect Miss Vinrace is doing now. I, I think I'll go for a walk. Would anyone care to join me? A walk? In this heat? I'll come. Oh, good. Very good. <laughs> Why is it that I can laugh at Mr. Hurst to you, but not to his face? Here, give me your hand. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, never ceases to amaze me. The respect that women give to men... I think we must have the same power over you as we're said to have over horses. You must see us three times as big as we really are. <laughs> what a funny thought. At least he's met his match with Mrs. Flushing. I do admire the English aristocracy, don't you? They're so unscrupulous. None of us would dare to behave as that woman does. We had reached a point high up on the cliffs where we could see nothing but sea in one direction and red sun-baked earth in another. Rachel lay down on her elbow and parted the tall grasses which grew on the edge, so that she might have a clear view of the water below. Do you miss England? Yes, in some ways. I miss my friends and all the things one does. She had become absorbed in the water, and the exquisitely pleasant sensation which a little depth of sea washing over rocks suggests. I could look at her without her noticing. She was wearing a dress of a deep blue colour, made of a soft, thin cotton which clung to the shape of her body. She had taken her hat off, and her face rested on her hand. Her lips were slightly parted in an expression of childlike intentness. Her other hand lay on the ground. It was well-shaped and competent, and the square-tipped, nervous fingers were those of a musician. I suddenly realised that far from being unattractive, her body was very attractive to me. I wanted very much to hold her in my arms. You write novels, don't you? What? Sorry. Didn't you say you write novels? Yes. I haven't finished one, but I, I will. What do you write about? I'm trying to write a novel about silence. It's hard. It must be. What do you do with your days? In London? Yes. I played the piano mostly. But not all the time. No. Describe one of your days to me. A typical day. Well, it was mostly spaces between meals. Mm. That's how I think of one of my days. Breakfast nine, luncheon one, tea five, dinner eight. One couldn't be late. Mm. In the morning I practiced for hours and hours. After lunch we did something that had to be done. My aunts and I, that is. We'd do the shopping or take a message. We visited the poor a good deal, old charwoman with bad legs, <laughs> women who want tickets for hospitals. She went on to describe her house to me in minute detail. It was as though she was back there with the dumb waiter and the neck of lamb and the green plush chairs. But this must be very boring for you. Not at all. 
There's nothing interesting about my life. But you've no idea how much it interests me. Why? Partly because you're a woman, I suppose. Oh, I see. I see. You're studying me scientifically, like Mr. Hurst. No, 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 not at all. I wouldn't do that. I want to know about you. It is amazing, though, how little we know about women's lives. Everything's from a man's point of view. It's absurd. If I were a woman, I think I'd blow my brains out. <laughs> you wouldn't. I would. I really think I would. I think it's difficult for us to understand how anyone else lives. It's impossible. We think we know someone, but we don't. We only know what we think of them. Hurst has a theory that we're all separate, that we're all standing in chalk circles drawn around our feet, and we're lucky if there's just one other person in our circle or part of our circle. I don't think it's true, but I do. But I don't think it's a bad thing. Why must we always come together? I like being alone. I think that's when I'm closest to what people call being happy, when I'm walking alone in the park or singing to myself, and knowing that no one cares at all. I feel very free. It's like being the wind or the sea. But that—that's not true. I mean, you—you you like people. You like talking, and、um... I do like people. I like practically everyone I've ever met. She turned away with a curious fling of her hands and gazed out to sea. A feeling of intense depression had come over me. It seemed clear that she would never care for one person over another. She was quite indifferent to me. But then she turned back. I like you. Do you like me? Yes. I like you immensely. It's late. Look at the sky. But time doesn't count here, does it? It will be dark soon. They'll be wondering where I am. We walked quickly back along the little path through the olive trees until we reached the small gate which led down to the back of the villa. The garden was just visible, empty now, full of long shadows. Your gate. Yes. She couldn't ask me to come in. I couldn't say I hoped we would meet again. There was nothing to be said, and so, without a word, she passed through and was soon invisible. And immediately my old discomfort returned. Only now it was stronger than ever. Our words had gone round and round and used up all the time. They had drawn us close together and flung us apart, and left me in the end unsatisfied still, ignorant of what she felt and who she was. But there was one thing I did know. Words were not enough. Not with her. I wanted more. Rachel. Faith was disappearing, even as I sang. It was spilling out of my mouth and dripping, splattering onto the floor. I should never have come. It wasn't even a real church, just a dingy chapel under the hotel where the monks had once come to pray. Until a few months ago, it had been a storeroom. I could still see broken chairs and parasols and disembodied tables leaning against the walls. I should never have come. I had known in my heart that Terence wouldn't be here. He didn't even go to church. I looked about at the people. Helen and Sinjin were right. Christians are appalling. I looked at Susan Warrington peering past her clasped hands to see who she could see. An old Mrs. Paley sucking a sweet like a camel. I looked at the woman across the aisle. She was wearing a nurse's uniform and had an expression of devout attention. What could she possibly know of God? How could she conceive of anything far outside her own experience? A woman with a commonplace face like hers, a little round red face lined by trivial duties and trivial spites. It was over. I stood still for a few moments. 
I thought I would cry. But then what would be the point? Three days. I had not seen him for three days. For two whole glorious weeks he had visited every day or sent me notes inviting me for walks or sent me books he thought I would love. And now three days had passed with nothing. What had I done? How could this be happening? I had to get home. I made my way towards the narrow stairs which led up into the hall. Miss Vinrace. Oh, did I give you a fright? <laughs> Miss Flushing. Stay to luncheon. It's such a dismal day, Sunday. They don't even give one roast beef. You have to stay with me. I'm sorry, but I was just... I and then I saw him. Now. My husband has Terence. He had been there after all. He was with St. John and Evil and Murgatroyd. They were laughing. He must have been at the back. He must have seen me. Why hadn't he come to sit with me? An image flashed through my head, an image I had been seeing a lot lately, of Terence walking across an empty room to stand beside me. I didn't know what it meant, but I had been seeing it a lot. Rachel! Miss Vinrace is dining with me today. Come along, we'll go up to my room until the gong sounds. She plucked at my arm and prodded me up the staircase. I looked back. Evelyn was leading him away. He wasn't even looking at me. Sanctuary! English people abroad, eh? Ain't they awful? What did you make of the service? I thought it was dreadful. Uh, I thought it was a loathsome exhibition. I thought the minister was a supercilious fraud. Uh, and his sermon was plagiarised. And everyone was there to show off. Marvellous! Marvellous! I thought the pianist needed to be shot. I couldn't agree more. Next time we'll go to that pretty church in the town, eh? At least we won't understand the words. <laughs> I'm never going to church again. Ever. Good for you. I only go because I've always gone. Don't it feel nice to take a hat off? What's out the window? I'm so sorry. I was just looking at our villa. I've never seen it from here before. I do adore coming up there. Yes, everyone comes now. I'm not surprised. Get away from this place. Your aunt shouldn't have made it so charming. Which do you like best, Mr Hewitt or Mr Hurst? Mr Hewitt? Is that the stout one? They were with me in church. T'other one was reading Greek. Sappho. <laughs> what a hoot. I read the Ode to Aphrodite during the litany. I remembered when I had thought him stout. But that was when I could see him properly, clearly. Before he became this big, bright globe in the centre of my head. Three days. I should go home. I'll show you something you'll like. Open the wardrobe. The wardrobe? Here, I'll do it. Look at all this stuff. Put it on the bed. You can touch it. You can touch it. Shawls, cloaks, embroideries. Beautiful, ain't it? And look at these. Have you ever seen beads like those? Of course you haven't. Brochures, earrings, tassels. It's all here. <gasps> the native women make them. They're not old. They're new. They still wear them now. My husband rides about and finds them. They don't know what they're worth, so we get them cheap. <laughs> and then we'll sell them to smart women in London. <laughs> well. <laughs> they're interesting. Interesting colours. I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to go up there and see things for myself. It's silly staying here with a pack of old maids as they were at the seaside in England. I want to go up the river and see the natives in their camps. It's only a matter of ten days under canvas. What do you say? You'd I, be game, wouldn't you? I, we must make up a party. Ten people could hire a launch. You and Mrs Ambrose will come and, and Mr Hurst and, and other gentlemen. Mr Hewitt. And who else? We must make up a list. Pass me that notebook. This one? Yes, yes. And the pencil. Now... What about that engaged couple? I dare say they'd relish a little trip together. Susan and Arthur. Susan and Arthur. And Miss Allen will come. Yes, good. And that girl who's always with Mr Hewitt, she'll come. Which girl? You know the one, black hair, always in white. Something brewing there, I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> My heart was being pressed together by cold hands. Evelyn Murgatroyd. Yes, Evelyn Murgatroyd. You know, she's illegitimate. Mrs. Elliot told me yesterday. <laughs> that explains her behaviour, I suppose. A touch of the Estellas. Now, who else? I dare say I could persuade Mr. Elliot, but not Mrs. I think... I think I won't stay to lunch. What's that? I think I should go home. But nonsense. It'll only be a few minutes now. I, I'm sorry. Thank you for asking me. But I, Thank I... you. I'm sure I'll see you again soon. I walked quickly down the corridor. I didn't even know where I was going. Evil and Murgatroyd. Not me at all. It was Evil and Murgatroyd. Oh, Miss Vinrace, what luck. Miss Allen, could you do me the most enormous favour? I was just going to... Come inside, would you? 
Not very grand, but perfectly adequate. Evelyn Murgatroyd, how could I have been such a fool? So all his talk of her being predatory had just been jealousy. He wanted her to prey on him. Could you help me to fasten the hooks on my skirt? They're terribly fiddly. I can do them myself, but it takes me half an hour, and I'm never quite certain that I've done them properly. It would be awful to lose one skirt. Yes. Oh, thank you. I'll just take this dress off. Do sit down for a moment. That's my manuscript on the desk there. Age of Chaucer, age of Elizabeth, age of Dryden. I'm glad there aren't many more ages. I'm still in the middle of the 18th century. Does literature interest you? Oh, no, it's music with you, isn't it? And I generally find they don't go together. Sometimes, of course, we have prodigies. I once had the honour of teaching one. Are you a prodigy? She was prettier than me, of this course, girl. more vivacious, more confident. But then he had made me feel confident. There had been moments when I had been so daring, I had amazed myself. That would be lost now, along with everything else. I looked up to find Miss Allen watching me with a look of great kindness and simplicity. She had taken off her dress and was standing in a blouse and a short petticoat on broad, slate grey legs. For a moment I felt I would confide in her. She seemed to have known and experienced so much. Surely she would know what to say, what to do. But although there was kindness in her eyes, I could sense that she didn't want confidences. She was padded, snowed under by years of reticence. And who could blame her? We would pass each other in silence. Now, if you could just... She pulled on the striped skirt and I fastened it for her. There they are. There's the gong. Thank you so much. Now, what else do I need? My locket, my watch, my bracelet, and my suffrage society button, of course. Am I in a fit state to encounter my fellow beings? Yes. Are you staying for luncheon? You could dine with me. No. Why are you going home? I don't know where I'm going. Oh. Years of snow. You can stay here if you like. You could have a little rest or read something. You see, I have a miniature library. Thank you. Not at all. I'm very glad to be able to return some of the hospitality I've enjoyed at the villa. I do like coming up there. Yes. I'll come back after lunch to see if you're still here. Right. I'm putting a pair of shoes outside the door for cleaning. Don't trip over them if you leave. Right. There's some creme de menthe on the shelf above you. I've had it for 20 years, but you can open it if you like. Just be careful with the bottle. I've grown rather fond of it. A friend of mine gave it to me. It comes everywhere with me. I call it Oliver. I sat down on the bed. So this was the world. How horrible it was. How duplicitous and sordid and cruel and absurd. Full of churches and politicians and misfits and lonely old ladies and huge impostors. Men like Mr. Dalloway, men like the minister, Evelyn, the hospital nurse, Mrs. Flushing and her orders. Him. Him. I could feel my pulse beating under my flesh, struggling, fretting. For a few moments, my heartbeat was the source of all the life in the world, which fought to burst forth, now here, now there, and was crushed by the imposition of ponderous stupidity, by the weight of the entire world. Rachel, there you are. Are you all right? Are you feeling better, Miss Vinraith? Yes, thank you. An hour had passed. I had wandered into the garden. A group of them were sitting under the trees, drinking coffee. They were all there, even Helen and St. John. But he was not, and neither was she. I sat down next to St. John, who was completely engrossed in a book. He put a brotherly hand on my shoulder. I'd come to like him of late. I'd come to understand that he was funny and very kind-hearted, 
and he was honest. Miss Vinrace is coming on the expedition, aren't you? Are you, Rachel? I don't see why not. Ten days under canvas. My husband will organise it. We'll go along in a boat, and if we see something interesting, we'll tell them to stop and put us off. It does sound exciting, but rather uncomfortable, I fear. I suppose washing would be out of the question, and baths. And that's terribly important, is it? I felt intensely irritated by Helen, always criticising, always belittling everything. It's quite important to me. Let's all think of reasons not to go. I didn't say I wouldn't go. Well, if you don't come, you'll regret it for the rest of your lives. There's Evelyn. Oh, yes, with her latest conquest. My stomach lurched. This was it. They all knew. I forced myself to turn around. It was Evelyn. But it was not Terence. It was another man I'd never seen before. They were holding hands. He was whispering to her. She seems keen on him. Yes. Perhaps this one will stick. Hello, everyone. Ah! Sit down, Mr... Uh, which are you? Mr Hewitt, Terence. Sit down, sit down. You look hot. He had come from another direction. He hadn't even glanced at Evelyn. He caught my eye. A sad, almost plaintive, questioning look. I've been walking. I've been in a strange mood today. Couldn't settle. I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm taking an expedition up the river, Mr Hewitt, and you have to come. Ten nights under canvas. What do you say? Is Miss Vinrace coming? Yes, I think I am. I'll come too. He smiled at me. Above our heads, the branches sighed. Little particles of dust or blossom fell down onto the table. The sun emerged from behind a solitary cloud. It was a beautiful day. What is it, Mrs. Flushing? Mackenzie's hut. It must be. Is that Mackenzie's hut, Wilfred? It certainly is. The hut where he died. Oh. Who's Mackenzie? I looked across at the hut on the bank. It was a desolate place in a small clearing, with a large rent in the roof and the ground around it scarred with fires and scattered with rusty open tins. Surely you've heard of Mackenzie, Mr. Hurst? I surely haven't, Mrs. Flushing. Uh, Mackenzie, the great explorer. He got farther into the forest than any other man. He caught a fever, tried to get back, but died almost within reach of civilization. So that's where we are. Just out of reach of civilization. Did they find his dead body there? They found his body and his skins and his notebook. The planned expedition had come to pass. A very small boat, which throbbed beneath our feet, was carrying us up the river and through the forest. There were six of us. Myself and Rachel, Mrs. Flushing, Mr. Wilfred Flushing, Terence Hewitt and St. John Hurst. We had set off on the afternoon of the previous day and had been at once enchanted and thrilled by the scenery we were passing through. There were emerald trees growing precariously from high banks of yellow sand, swamps quivering with long reeds and tall bamboos on the top of which swayed vivid green and scarlet birds. Then there were stretches where the trees were so dense that we could hardly see the sky, and we heard monkeys chuckling maliciously and parrots screeching, and then long periods of silence, such as there are in a cathedral when a boy's voice has ceased and the echo of it still seems to haunt about the remote places of the roof. Nothing much is happening, is it? What did you imagine would happen? I don't know. But I expected something. I expected us all to be... different. But we're all just the same. Except we're on a boat. Poor St. John. I blame him. Mr. Blushing. Why? Why does he have to dress up like that, so formal? If he took his tie off, I could take mine off too. He set a tone. And those screens of his last night to separate the men from the women. And what did he think I was going to do? Jump on his wife in a frenzy of animal passion? <laughs> it was rather ridiculous. I had to hold up a towel around her while she changed into her shift. It was so dark that no one would have seen anything, even had they wanted to. 
and those two are annoying me intensely. Terence and Rachel. They're so silent. Why don't they talk? I think they're waiting for something. What? Oh, I see. Well, why don't they just get on with it? Instead of being romantic and exciting, they're being interminably dull. I looked over at the silent pair. They were sitting a little apart from one another. Terence was attempting to read a book of poetry. But Rachel was just staring out at the water we were leaving behind. I had never spoken to my niece about her feelings for Terence Hewitt, though I had watched her being washed along by them, buffeted this way and that, sometimes entirely submerged, rushing as though to the brink of a waterfall. Occasionally I had felt moved to throw her a lifeline, offered generalised comments on the difficulties of life which she could have applied to herself and developed if she wished. But she had not chosen to confide in me, and I respected that. After all, why shouldn't she love him, marry him? She was twenty-five now. Moreover, she was a far cry from the naive girl who had been kissed by Mr. Dalloway on the voyage out. I slept abysmally, did you? In fits and starts. I was either too hot or too cold. I got up at first light and started a poem about God and horrified myself by practically proving he does exist. <laughs> Imagine if he did, them. We'd be for it. An old gentleman in a beard and a long blue dressing gown, extremely testy and disagreeable. <laughs> Can you suggest any rhymes? I've used rod, sword and trod so far. Look how it's changing. It had grown suddenly lighter. The wall of trees which we had become accustomed to had ended and opened out. On both banks of the river lay a lawn-like space, grass-covered and planted with a gentleness and order which suggested human care. The Flushings came to stand with us. It almost reminds one of an English park. I think it might be Arundel or Windsor if you cut down that strange bush with yellow flowers. And by Jove, look! Deer! Wild deer! Good heavens! Beautiful. I've never in my life seen anything bigger than a hare. What an ass I was not to bring my coat up. What was it? A herd of wild deer. I missed it. They ran off that way. Twenty, at least. We're going to stop at the next landing stage. We're very close to the village now. An hour and a half. Una hora y media. You see? Something's happening. Yes. Those sailors are laughing at us. I'm not surprised. We must look silly. Trekking into the jungle in our smart white clothes like we're on a Sunday school picnic. Don't call it a jungle. You're not scared, are you? Of course not. We set off up what was almost like the drive to a stately home. Terence and Rachel had immediately drawn together and were walking a little way in front. It looked as though they might be talking. I felt a sudden wave of tenderness and protectiveness towards them. All of a sudden, however, they stopped walking and Terence pointed to something ahead. Wait there, everyone. I'll clear things with the chief. Is this it? Yes, the native village. Excellent. That's exactly how I imagined it. The houses are like nests. It's so quiet. Do you think we should be here? They're used to Europeans. Isn't that chief splendid? What do you think he's saying? He's asking which of us is the meatiest. That'll be you, Hewitt. They certainly wouldn't want a sinewy devil like you. Now, now, children. Come this way. Mr. Flushing began nodding and gesticulating to us, and slowly we all moved forward and entered the village. There were very few men to be seen, but a fair number of women... They were squatting on the ground in triangular shapes, moving their hands, either plaiting straw or kneading something in bowls. When they saw us, they paused for a moment, and their long, narrow eyes slid round and fixed upon us with the motionless, inexpressive gaze of those removed from each other, far, far beyond the plunge of speech. Their hands moved again, but the stare followed us as we began to explore. Passing over our legs, our bodies, our heads, not without hostility. Like the crawl of a fly in winter. Let's look in this hut. 
I don't know if I want to. I think it's empty. Look. Guns. Rushes. I wonder if they burn those. My eyes grew accustomed to the darkness. I could make out the face of a woman. She drew apart her shawl and uncovered her breast to the lips of her baby. Her eyes never left my face. Come on. Mr. Flushing had begun trading with the chief. Mrs. Flushing was being offered sweetmeats. Rachel and Terence were standing quietly under a tree. They moved off together towards the forest. Let's go. Yes. I felt like a big, heavy-footed soldier. So did I. It made me feel lonely. Did it? It was rather beautiful. A beautiful life. They were like parts of one organism. Yes. We're very delicate, aren't we? Human beings. They looked so tiny compared with the trees. We're like ants. We're not even as strong as ants. Our limbs, our veins, they break so easily and let the life escape. Yes. I hope my children are all right. Of course they are. I just pictured a boat sinking beneath the water in England at midday. Wait for me! Wait! What do you think of these brooches? You don't think they're old? Where are Mr. Hewitt and Miss Finrace? We need to leave if we're to keep to schedule. I, I shall have I'll to... go and get them. I know where they are. I hurried back over the springy grass towards where I had last seen them. I climbed up a small green mound from where I could see into the trees. They were there. They were standing in each other's arms. Silent. The day had been very hot and very long, and when the sun went down and the colours were blotted out, the cool night air seemed to press soft fingers upon the eyelids, sealing them down. Mr and Mrs Flushing retired behind screens at opposite sides of the deck, and St John, engulfed in a yawn, wandered off too, muttering about the stars. I sat on in my white chair, staring into the blackness with Rachel and Terence beside me. I shall never forget that night. Helen? Yes? We're engaged. I'm very happy for you. Truly happy for you. Thank you. What happened? We were walking along. We were in the forest. Neither of us could speak. But, but then I decided that I would throw a red fruit up into the air and when it landed, I would begin. I didn't know you did that. Yes. Uh, and it landed and I said, we're happy together. And I said yes. And I said we love each other. And I said we love each other because <laughs> we do. I know that now. I know what love is. Do you realise what you're doing? You're young, Rachel. You're both young and marriage. What? Well, it's not easy. It depends on both of you. I'm quite serious and certain. I'm 27, not so young. I've about 700 a year. My temper's good on the whole. My health excellent, though Hurst detects a gouty tendency. I think I'm very intelligent. Yes, moderately. Though unfortunately rather lazy. I intend to allow Rachel to be a fool if she wants to and... What else can I tell you? Do you find me satisfactory in other respects? Yes. I like what I know of you. But then one knows so little. We shall live in London. We are very, very happy, Helen. I didn't know what happiness was until now. What are you thinking? We can't see you, only your dress. We want advice, Helen. Advice? What can I tell you? I know I scold, Rachel, but I'm not much wiser myself. I'm older, of course. I'm halfway through and you're just beginning. It's puzzling, marriage. Sometimes it's disappointing that great things aren't as great, perhaps, as one expects. But it's interesting. Always interesting. And then there are pleasures one doesn't expect. I'm sure you'll be happy. 
We must write to your father, Rachel. He must give his consent. You'll have to. It has to happen now. Yes, I dare say. But I must go to bed. And if you have any sense, you'll do the same in ten minutes or so. Good night. Good night. Good night. I left them, two figures indistinguishable in the darkness, two figures who had sunk together down, down, and curled up at the bottom of the world. They were out of reach now. Nothing could touch them. But why then did I feel so fearful? Why did I feel so strangely, indescribably sad? Gratified to hear of your engagement, all possible wishes for all possible happiness. Yours sincerely, W. Pepper. I think that says. Is that Pepper, Rachel? Rachel. I think it's Pepper. What an extraordinary hand. Oh, it's no good. What? You. Here am I, the best musician in South America, not to speak of Europe and Asia. And I can't play a note because you keep interrupting me. I've no objection to nice simple tunes, but that up and down business, well, it's like an old dog going round and round on its hind legs. Scales. They're called scales, and you can't have your nice simple tunes without them. Come and look at these with me, will you? Now you've stopped. We ought to start answering some of them. Is, is that pepper? Yes. Pest. And uh, this one is from the Elliots. All best wishes for your future happiness. Correct, but not very vivid. They're sheer and utter nonsense. All of them. That's a bit harsh. They're all from completely different people, but they all say the same thing in practically the same words. They're meaningless. Well, of course they're absurd. Of course they say things just because other people say them, but that doesn't mean they aren't well-intentioned. How could any of those people have any comprehension of what I was feeling? The idea that they thought they had the right to pretend for even a single second that they did appalled me. Insincerity, lies, pretense. Here it all was again, and it had nothing to do with Terence and I. For two weeks after our return from the expedition, when only Helen and my uncle and St. John knew our secret, we had been left to walk and sit and wander, to visit silent places where the flowers had never been picked, to express to each other without fear of judgment all our beautiful, vast desires for ourselves and for the world. But now my father's blessing had been received and our engagement had been made public and Terence arrived at the villa every day with messages and comments and letters, all conspiring to suggest that our relationship, far from being special or particular, was regular, expected even, well-trodden ground. Mrs Flushing wants us to go up to the hotel and have tea with her this afternoon. I don't want to. Rachel... Why must we always do what Mrs. Flushing wants? There's a tennis tournament. I think it'll be jolly. Well, I don't. You don't really want to deny Miss Allen the opportunity of beaming at you. You said yourself what a nice woman she is. She is a nice woman. And old Mrs. Paley is simply desperate to dispense some matronly wisdom to you. Old Mrs. Paley? I don't even like old Mrs. Paley. Oh, she's a very benign old creature. She's been married twice, you know. She has seven children scattered about the globe. Well, I don't intend to have seven children. I don't intend to be like her in any way, shape or form. I certainly won't have old lady eyes. <laughs> she looks me up and down as I were a horse. Do you know how many days we have left till we sail back to England? Twenty-one. I counted them this morning. Twenty-one, eh? And my father will be here in a week and everything will change. It has to be us, Terence, just you and me. Come here. Hmm. I remember the first time I saw you. I thought you were like a creature who'd lived all its life among pearls and old bones. Your hands were wet. I'd been trailing them in the stream. And I thought you were a prig. What? Not really a prig, just 
overconfident. <laughs> and you and St. John were sort of the same, very energetic and big. But then you fell in love with me. I didn't fall in love with you. I didn't really know what I was feeling. Rachel Vinrace, you fell in love with me. Didn't you say you used to sit in the drawing room and gaze at my window? Didn't you wander about the hotel like an owl in the sun? <laughs> I might have done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were in love with me from the very start, only you didn't know it. Do you remember the three days? What three days? The three days when we didn't see each other. I did come down to the hotel then. I wandered round and round. I was wretched. I thought you were in love with Evelyn Murgatroyd. Evelyn Murgatroyd? Credit me with some sense. Why didn't you come and see me in those three days? I, I honestly don't know. I can't remember. I remember there was a time when I knew you'd been at the hotel, but you hadn't sought me out. And I thought you must want to be separate for a while. But then I often feel that with you. Do you? Yes. You cut off from me. There's something I can't get hold of in you. Even playing the piano just then, you had withdrawn from me, from everything. You don't want me as I want you. So completely, I mean. Oh, but it, it's not a bad thing. I love you all the more for it. Because I know you're choosing me because you want to, not because you need to. We'll love each other for the rest of our lives, won't we? Yes, we will. How many children do you intend to have out of interest? Hmm. Two, I think. A boy and a girl. I finally gave in and agreed to go to the hotel on the condition that Terence did all the talking. We had lunch with Helen and set off down the hill. The tennis tournament was already underway when we arrived. Mrs Flushing had set up a table on the veranda of the pavilion. She spotted us immediately and beckoned us over. Miss Allen and Mr Pepper were with her. Here, here, you're sitting with me. Cheers, cheers for the happy couple. Well, this is nice. This is very nice indeed. Hearty congratulations to you both. Thank you. Thank Bring you. them in here. Move those others along. Getting engaged seems to be quite the fashion. You and Arthur and Susan. Such a coincidence. I cringed inwardly. Sit down, sit down. This match is almost over. They have them by the scruff. Uh, and I hear congratulations are due to you too, Miss Allen. You have finished your book. Yes, I think I can fairly say I have. That is omitting Swinburne. Beowulf to Browning. I rather like the two Bs. Uh. Beowulf to Browning. I think that is the kind of title which might catch one's eyes on a railway bookstall. Yes, I think it is. I must confess that if I'd known how many classics there are and how verbose the best of them contrived to be, I should never have undertaken the work. They only allow one 70,000 words, you see. 70,000? And one has to say something about everybody. But there, it's done now and, and I'm actually rather pleased with it. It's the second book that is really taxing. Oh, I doubt there'll be a second, Mr. Pepper. Good afternoon, Miss Vinrace, Mr. Hewitt. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Congratulations are in order, Miss Vinrace. Quite an event. Yes. And you were a little girl. Yes. Uh, Vinrace is coming out, I hear. He'll arrive next week. What's that? Rachel's father is coming next week. Ah, oh, you'll have to be on your best behaviour, eh, Mr. Hewitt? Nervous, are you? No, I... I met your father once, you know. Did you? He came back to me the other day. Met him at a party. Must be ten years ago. One of those dreadful London crushes where you don't talk, just look at each other. I shook his hand. Oh, I remember the name. Unusual. Vinrace. Shipping. Yes, that's right. I, I detest parties. If I'm obliged to go to one from a wish not to offend, I walk into the middle of the room, say, ha, ha, at the top of my voice, consider my duty done and walk out again. Mm. Ridiculous. I'm going to give a party when I get back, and you'll all be invited, and I shall set people to watch you, Mr. Pepper, and if I hear you've been caught saying, ha, ha, I shall do something very dreadful to you indeed. <laughs> I had not seen Mr. Pepper for some time. It amused me to find that he had been adopted by Mrs. Flushing. He was still in the same neat grey suit, buttoned up against the exuberance of a foreign climate, which might wish to take liberties with him and there was no sign at all of any sun having reached his face. But there was a hint of a new sparkle in his eyes, and he was certainly more animated. For him to volunteer any information of a personal kind was rather extraordinary. He smiled now, like a baffled old baby, 
and took a sip of his tea. Are you young people going to join in the tournament? No, we've only come to watch. You should get out there and play, Mr. Hewitt. You look like you could do with the exercise. Oh, here's Mrs. Elliot. How is he? A little better, thank you. Sit down and have tea. Push that chair over, Mr. Pepper. Is Mr. Elliot unwell? He has had a fever, a rather high one. I'm very sorry to hear that. Oh, dear. But he's over the worst now. Thank goodness. He's not an easy patient, though. He wants to know what his temperature is. And if I tell him, he gets anxious. And if I don't tell him, he suspects. <laughs> you know what men are like when they're ill. And, of course, there are none of the proper appliances. And though he seems very willing and anxious to help, one can't feel that Dr. Rodriguez is the same as a proper doctor. He's the brother of the hotel proprietor, you know. I see. If you would come and see him, Mr. Hewitt, I know it would cheer him up. Lying there in bed all day, and the flies... I will certainly come. And your uncle, perhaps, Miss Vinray. I'll ask him, but he's terribly busy trying to finish Pinder before we leave. I spent six weeks of my honeymoon in having typhoid at Venice, but I still managed to have a good time. Yes, but then there is virtually nothing which can ruin a honeymoon. And you have all that to look forward to. <laughs> I must say, I envy you, I really do. So do I. Yes, to really be 25 and not to have to imagine it. And the things you young people are going to see. When I think how the world has changed in my lifetime, I can see no limit to what may happen in the next 50 years. Well, things will go from bad to worse. That's what will happen. Oh, no. No, Mr Pepper, you're quite wrong. There's going to be much better people than us. I do agree. All around me I see women, young women, women with household cares of every sort, going out and doing things that I should not have thought it possible to do. And yet they remain women. But do they? Oh, yes. They give a great deal to their children. The future, Mr Pepper. We must all embrace the future. And so the afternoon went on. People coming and going, talking, arguing, laughing, sometimes looking at us and sometimes not. And none of it was as bad as I had feared it would be. I didn't even mind when Susan and Arthur, having won the tournament, came over to sit with us, all sunburnt and vigorous, and murmured congratulations in knowing voices and shook our hands. I felt remarkably secure and definite, as though Terence, whilst offering me a life with him, had also delivered me my independence. What was there to frighten or perplex in the prospect of life? The world was, in truth, so large, so hospitable. And after all, it was so simple. We were all looking for love. Not necessarily the love of a man for a woman, but love. I had understood that now. And I would always understand it. Sabrina Fair, listen where thou art sitting under the gloomy, cool, translucent waves in twisted braids of lilies knitting the loose train of thy amber dropping hair. My head aches. Your head aches? Yes, I've tried moving it about, but it's very bad. I just had a note from St. John. He'll be joining us for dinner. Apparently Evelyn Murgatroyd is pursuing him again. What's the matter? Rachel's head aches. Does it? Yes. Well, if you will go trekking off to the hotel and sitting about in the sun, go and have a lie down. I'm sure it'll be gone when you wake up. Yes, Yes, go and have a lie down. I went to bed and lay in the dark for what seemed like a very long time. But my headache did not go. It got worse. What's more, I started to notice that the walls of my room, instead of being straight and flat, looked slightly curved. And when I shut my eyes, the pulse in my head beat so strongly that each thump seemed to tread upon a nerve, piercing my forehead with a little stab of pain. And when Helen came in, hours and hours later... She stopped very suddenly and looked at me strangely. Rachel, how do you feel? I don't feel well at all. I don't feel well at all.
Was that Rodriguez leaving? Yes. What did he say? What he always says, that there is no cause for alarm. Good, very good. We can't go on like this, Terence. Either you've got to find another doctor, or you must tell Rodriguez to stop coming, and I'll manage for myself. It's no use for him to say that Rachel is getting better. She's not better. She's worse. I'm afraid things have become critical. I don't want him here again. I entered Rachel's bedroom. It was dark and quiet. Mrs. Chaley was sitting by her bed. Mr. Hewitt, you come and sit here. I'll just... She had changed. Her lips were drawn and her cheeks were sunken and flushed. There it falls. What does? What, what falls, Rachel? The head. Why doesn't he come? Who? I, I'm here, Rachel. It's Terence. I'll take over from you now, Mrs. Chaley. You should have some lunch. Yes, madam. If I could just say, Mr. Hewitt, sir... I don't trust that doctor any more than Mrs. Ambrose does. Such hairy hands, and he would never sit down, always wanting to get out of the door. Sorry. You think she's in danger? No one can go on being this ill day after day without... This is the fourth day. I'll go and find another doctor. I'm lying at the bottom of the sea. I'm not dead. Not dead. I'm curled up at the bottom of the sea. It's important that I see these things, these things which pass. I have to understand them. There's the man with the mules. There's the old lady with the knife. There are animals in the trees. Now they're flying. If I listen, if I watch, if I watch, gone. Start again. It's hot. A little piece of white cloth. They come and turn me over at the bottom of the sea. It was St. John who brought the doctor in the end. He could see what a state Terence was in, and when it transpired that there was no other doctor in Santa Marina, that the nearest one was thirty miles away in the hills, St. John set off on horseback to find him. It was almost midnight by the time he arrived back. The doctor, a Frenchman named Lesage, was tired and a little irritable at having been made to come such a long way. But he had a serious, professional demeanour, and I took him up to see Rachel straight away. What do you think of him, Hurst? Knows his stuff, I should say. Ah. How long will this go on? Yes. I can't get used to it. To this suffering. I didn't know it was there all the time, underneath everything. How does anyone dare to love? How did I dare to live like that so... quickly, so carelessly? You all do that. Never again. I'll never forget that it's there, that it's waiting underneath all the happiness and the safety. And, and I'll tell Rachel when she's well. Come and sit down, eh? He's taking a long time. Not really. Hewitt. I know I never said anything to you about her. Well, about your engagement. I didn't. I just want you to know that it does make me glad. And I know it's important. The most important thing, probably. You are the gentleman who is engaged to the young lady? Yes. How is she? Is she very ill? <sighs> of course, of course. She's very ill. You did well to bring me, Mr. Hurst. I will return in the morning. Good night. Helen? Helen? What time is it? 
It's dawn. Have you been there all night? Rachel? She just spoke to me. She asked me what day it is. Like herself. <laughs> Helen, no, Helen, Helen, don't. Come here, come here. Oh, you've been so strong. She's better. She's better today. Dr. Lesage arrived very early. This time I was allowed into the room while he examined her. She has a, a chance of life. But you, you would say she is better. She is so much clearer, and her temperature... It, it does not mean a great deal at this stage. I still consider her condition to be very grave. I left the room and staggered down the stairs. If I could get outside, the world might seem real again. If there was air and trees, a patch of ground, a chance of life. Rachel, we're engaged. We're engaged. A chance of life. Mr. Hewitt. Mrs. Flushing. How is Miss Finray's today? She's... She has a chance of life. She's a little better, perhaps. Good. Very good. Fact is, I've been getting myself in a state. Foolish, of course. Uh, I've been thinking she might have caught it on the expedition. There might have been diseases on the river. Has the doctor said as much? She could have caught it anywhere. Mr. Elliot had a fever, and he wasn't on the expedition. Yes, I see. Good. <laughs> That's what people have been telling me, but... Oh, foolish, of course. Mr. Pepper says the maid here doesn't wash the vegetables. You'll let us know when she's back on her feet. Helen? Helen? Why don't you hear me? I push out my voice as far as I can until it becomes a bird. Flies away. But I don't know if it reaches you. I'm floating. Floating on the surface of a dark, sticky pond. I'm on a wave. It bears me up and down with it. Why does it hurt so much? <sighs> Helen... Take this medicine, Rachel. Open your mouth. I'm very tired. Good girl. Good girl. I'll sit here for a while. You just have to get better now. Your father will be here in a day or two. And we'll all sail home together. It'll be rather exciting having Terence with you. And we did have fun, didn't we? On the voyage out. You just have to get better now. They wrestled up, they wrestled down. That day passed very strangely and slowly. And still, For once, Ridley did not disappear into his study and settle to his work, but paced up and down, up and down. Like St. John came to sit with me, but neither of us had anything to say. The evening drew on, and the red light of the sunset glittered far away on the sea. And still we waited. Dr. Lesage, what news? Mr. Hewitt, I think you should go up now. Why? Go, Terence. Helen was sitting by the bedside. She rose and gave up her chair to me. As we passed, our eyes met. Her eyes were wonderfully clear, and there was a deep calm and sadness in them. Hello, Terence. Well, Rachel. Where's that hand? Here. It's been wretched without you. But when we're together, we're perfectly happy. She closed her eyes. I kept hold of her hand. Peace was invading every corner of my soul. I held my breath and listened acutely. She was still breathing. I had no desire to move. I went on thinking. We seemed to be thinking together. I felt I was Rachel as well as myself. I listened again. 
No. She had ceased to breathe. So much the better. This was death. It was nothing. It was to cease to breathe. It was happiness. Perfect happiness. The union which had been impossible while we lived was ours now. No two people have ever been so happy as we have been. No one has ever loved as we have loved. Terence. Come now. Rachel. Rachel! Sinjin, I thought you'd gone. I just went back to get some clothes. I'll stay here tonight. Did you watch the storm? Um, not really. Elliot was beating Pepper at chess. I've been watching it. I had a wonderful view. The lightning went right out over the sea and lit up the waves and the ships far away. They were all very sorry at the hotel. They all want to know if there's anything they can do. Has he been down? No. Lightning, look. Perhaps it's coming back. But it wasn't. The storm had ended and moved on to another place. The sky was once more a deep and solemn blue. Vaporish mists were being driven swiftly across the moon. The shape of the sea was visible at the bottom of the air. Enormous. Dark. Unending. I think I'll go to bed. Yes. I'll go to bed. In The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf, Rachel was Laura Fraser, Helen was Rebecca Johnson, Terence was Bertie Carvel, Sinjin was Ronan Vibert, and Clarissa was Susanna Harker. The Voyage Out was dramatized by Helen Edmondson and produced and directed by Nadia Molinari. <laughs>